God's good. God's doing all sorts of good stuff around here. And uh, we've been talking about renewal uh, and being refreshed by God the last few weeks as we've looked through Nehemiah. Uh, we saw the importance of prayer and fasting before we begin to do anything, that we take time to line up our heart with God's heart and our plans with God's plans, that we take time for prayer and fasting. Uh, we saw the importance of, of building up a community of people to support you and to surround you in whatever you're going to do because God is calling you to a task that's too big for you to accomplish by yourself. And we saw that Nehemiah brought the people together by giving them a focus, a, a purpose that was greater than their problems. And last week we said that if you're experiencing renewal and refreshment, you should also expect what? Opposition, right? And uh, not everybody's going to be happy about the renewal and freshman that's recurring in your life. So if you're experiencing that, we also have to be prepared for opposition. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be scared. We just have to be prepared knowing that opposition will arise. Well, this week we're in Nehemiah chapter 8. And when you come to Nehemiah chapter 8, the wall has been built. And now the people are celebrating. And we said in the very beginning of this sermon series that the wall symbolized the spiritual state of Israel. So now that the wall is built, we're also looking at a people who have been revitalized and renewed. And the cool thing about chapter 80 is, is that we see a picture of what a renewed people look like. And I think that's really important for us to have. Think about it this way. If, uh, if you're driving your car around town uh, and you notice that your gas gauge is getting near empty, uh, what do you do? Yeah, you take, you drive it home and park it and hope that's, you know, no, right. You know what, you don't, when you're driving around, you don't live it up to your feelings to know whether or not the car is getting near empty, do you? I mean, you don't go, you know, I think my car might be, I'm kind of feeling like it might need gas. I mean, most of us don't do that, do we? When you simply, you wonder about how your car is, so you look at the gas gauge and the gas gauge is very important. You don't leave important things up to feelings, do you? It's kind of like your bank. You don't, you don't kind of go, you know, when it's time to buy a car. You don't go, you know, I think I might have enough money to buy a car. I kind of feel like I have enough money, right? Well, some of you do, but that's a bad way to do it, all right? <laughs> Come to Financial Peace University and learn the right way to do it, all right? Listen, you don't leave, you don't leave those important decisions up to feelings. You have a gauge, and, and that's what we want to talk about. Chapter 8 kind of gives us a, a, a sign, kind of a gauge of what spiritual renewed people look like so that we can kind of hold up our life to that and say, how am I doing compared to what Nehemiah and the people look like when they were being renewed? Now, it's important to understand this. When you look at your gas gauge and you see that it's getting near empty, you don't do this. You don't go, oh, no, no, oh, it's awful. I'm never going to drive again. Ah, why? Why? Why me? You don't do that, do you? No, most of you say, you know what? Gas gauge is getting near empty. That means I need to stop and get some gas. Same thing here. As we kind of hold up our life according to the scripture, the purpose here is not to freak you out or anything. The purpose is just to say, listen, if I'm not where I want to be, I need to, I need to do something different. I need to take a break. I need to try to do something different in my life, not knowing that if I keep on doing what I've been doing, I'm going to keep on getting what I got, right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to hold up our life to Nehemiah chapter 8 and kind of see this, use Nehemiah chapter 8 as a gauge to how we're doing spiritually. So this morning, I'm going to begin in Nehemiah chapter 8. I'm going to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to ask you guys today to stand up while I read. So if y'all would stand up while I read the scripture this morning. All the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattitiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Messiah, and on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jemin, Akub, Shebatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. 
Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scribe to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees, and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was very great. Amen. Please be seated. The first thing I want to look at in this passage of Scripture that we read is uh, chapter 8, verse 2 of Nehemiah. It says this, On the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. I want you all to hear what happened there. Ezra came out and he read the scripture to the people. And he read Scripture and explained to them what the Scripture said for five to six hours. For five to six hours, he read the Scripture explaining what it meant to the people, and the people stood up and listened for five to six hours. Not only did it say the people stood up and listened, it said they listened attentively. They listened attentively to the Word of God. Now, I want to to ask you this. Uh, I read the words of Scripture for two and a half minutes. How'd you do? Anybody wonder what you're going to have for lunch? Anybody wonder if you're going to have to do this every Sunday? Two and a half minutes. I timed it this week. Kind of hard, wasn't it? Our minds tend to wander. But here, the Israelites listen to the Word of God five to six hours, standing up, listening attentively, because listen, when you get renewed and refreshed by the Spirit of God, you get a hunger for the Word of God. Listen, when God is renewing your life, you get hungry for the Word of God, because the closer you get to God, the more you realize that I'm not Him. The closer you get to God, the more you realize that you're not Him, and that God's ways are not your ways, and His thoughts are not your thoughts, and that God's plans are not your plans. And the more you realize, man, I make a mess of my life when I try to do it my way. And the closer I get to God, the more I realize God's ways are so much better than mine. And I now have a hunger to understand what God wants in my life. I have a hunger to to discover, God, what is your word? How have you called me to live? And what have you called me to be? I want to know it because, God, I realize that you are so much more than you see things I don't see and you know things I don't know and you have plans that I can't even imagine yet. And, God, I want to know what those plans are. And I have a hunger for the word of God. Renewed people hunger for God's word. So I remember a time that uh, uh, we were doing a building project at the church I was at before this one. And... and, uh, we were in the middle of, of kind of getting the, the heating and air conditioning system set. And there's a guy there named Tim Staley at this place. And, and I was arguing with Tim about the heating and air conditioning system. And Tim and I had been arguing for about five minutes about how the heating and air conditioning system should be set up in this new building. To understand this situation, you have to know who Tim is. Tim is a mechanical engineer. Tim goes across the country... Uh, helping corporations and businesses save money on their heating and air conditioning. I mean, that's what he does. 
Uh, he testifies, and he's an expert witness in cases where people are arguing about this kinds of thing. And so I'm arguing with Tim for about five minutes, and about five minutes in the argument, we're kind of, I'm passionate about it, and he's passionate about it, and I finally, I kind of started laughing. I said, Tim, I said, hang on a second here. When are you going to tell me that I'm an idiot to shut up? <laughs> I said, really, you know what? I mean, I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. I mean, how frustrating it has to be for you, for me to sit here and argue with you. And I appreciate your respect you're showing the pastor. But listen, man, it's time for you to tell me just to be quiet. Because I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. So I realized uh, he had knew so much more than I. I. I should be listening, not arguing. So when we begin to experience renewal in our, in our life, we stop arguing and we start listening. We stop telling God to bless all the things we want to do. And we start saying, God, tell me what you want me to do. Show me where you're at work and let me join with you there, Father. I just want to know what you're up to. We get hungry for God's work. The psalmist in uh, Psalm chapter 19 uh, gives us a picture of a, of a renewed spirit. He says these words, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. You hear the psalmist speaking. God, your words are sweet. Your words are precious. Far more precious than gold, Lord, is, is your word. Is the word of God sweet to you? That's what I'm going to ask you first, as we kind of just hold up our life to what's going on in Nehemiah. Is the word of God sweet to you? Do you hunger for God's word? It's the first sign I want us to look at here. Let's keep going. Let's go back to verse 1, though, now. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. All the people, it says, assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. Now, now here's the cool thing about this. If you remember the book of Nehemiah, this was a people who were divided in every way. They wouldn't come together to do anything at all. And now it says that they've all assembled as one man before the water gate. They've come together. Renewal and revival always brings unity to the body of Christ. Renewal and revival always brings unity to the body of Christ. When you get right with God, you get right with God's family. There's no other way about it. Listen, what, just imagine that if you came to me and said, Jeff... Uh, I really like you. You seem like a nice guy, but I've met your wife, and I can't stand her. <laughs> Just wondering if we wanted to go out and have a good time or something. Yeah, you know, that's not going to work, is it? It's not going to work at all. Imagine that you come to me and say, Jeff, I've met you and Susan, and y'all seem like nice people, but your kids, I can't stand, uh, and, and don't want to be around them. Uh, that's not going to work very well either, is it? You can't t tell me you love me and that you hate my family because they're too much a part of who I am. You can't say that you love God and that you're being renewed spiritually and say, I, I dislike the family of God. Getting right with God means you always get right with the family of God. That's what it means. It always means that we experience unity with the body of Christ. I've known some people in my 15, 16 years of ministry who experienced a counterfeit revival. They said they were coming to know God. They felt closer and closer to God. But the closer they got to God, the more distance was created between them and the family of God. Now, I want to tell you, that's not the way it works. I had a gentleman come to me one day. He said, uh, uh, well, he was causing some stuff in the church. And, and so I just uh, uh, went to visit with him and see what was going on. And he informed me that he had outgrown our church spiritually. I mean, he had gotten so spiritual that... Uh, that, that my sermons weren't deep enough for him and that the people were not deep enough for him. And what do you say to that? Uh, obviously, I wasn't spiritual enough to know how to answer that, well, you know, to answer that, that problem. Uh, but you know what? That's a counterfeit revival because his, what he was calling renewal was pushing him farther and farther away from the body of Christ. And that's not real. That's not what it looks like. Real renewal brings you closer and closer to the body of Christ. Listen, in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying. And uh, Jesus is about to be arrested. And so he's praying for uh, his disciples. He's praying for himself. And uh, it's really cool because when we look here, he also prays for us. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. It says this, My prayer is not for them alone. I say I'm not praying for just the disciples who, and the people I've known lately. He's also going to pray for us. 
I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. When Jesus prays for the body of Christ, listen to what he prays for. He didn't pray that we'd have big churches. Uh, he didn't pray uh, for all sorts of things that he could have prayed about. When he thinks about us today and he prays for us, he prays that we'll be one. And he knows that through our oneness and through our unity that we will declare that there is a God and that he is one. And we'll declare the reality of Christ's love for the church. Whenever you get right with God, you get right with the family of God. And one of the sure signs that renewal is happening in your life is when you look around at the body of Christ and you look at a bunch of uh, scoundrels and kind of a, people whose lives are messy and people of all sorts of different uh, phases on their spiritual walk. When you look around at the body of Christ and you say, I'm at peace with these people. This is right where I belong. This is where I need to be. Unity is a sign that renewal is going on. Let's, I, I just ask yourself this. Are you at peace with the body of Christ? Are you at peace with the body of Christ? Do you feel closer and closer to this group of people who come together to worship and to serve the Lord? All right, that's second sign. Here we go in verse 5. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. It so said, when the people experienced renewal, they worshiped God passionately. The scripture says, Amen, Amen. It simply conveys the intensity of their worship. They were worshiping God with all they had. They weren't simply going through the motions. That's what they had done while the wall was still in rubbles. But now the wall was up. They were spiritually alive again. And now they began to worship God with a passion. Uh, I, don't know. I, I don't know if you guys have ever been to a Razorback football game before. Some of you out here have tickets. That's great. It's good. I don't have any tickets, but I'll probably watch it on TV when I can. Uh, but I, for some of you who go to Razorback football games, for many of you, that's as close as you will ever get to real worship. Because when people are at a Razorback football game, I mean, they are adoring the hogs. I mean, their hands are raised up. They're fully engaged. They're passionate. They're not thinking about what's for dinner. They're simply right there in the midst of the game with all their emotions. They bring everything they have to the game. You don't talk to anybody during the game. I mean, they're just, they're just passionate right there in that moment, fully engaged. It's almost like real worship. And, and isn't it funny? that a guy who will go to a Razorback football game and wear a red plastic hog hat and put on his face a flesh-colored pig snout and raise his hands and go, woo, pig suey, that that same guy would be embarrassed to worship God passionately on Sunday? Oh, no, it just doesn't seem to fit to me. Renewed people worship God passionately. Because they love him and they adore him. Because he's worthy of all their praise and all their worship. Listen, uh, worshiping God passionately isn't about whether you raise your hands or not. It's not about whether you sing hymns or you sing praise songs. It's not about whether you jump up and down or sit down or kneel or any of that. It's about being fully engaged in this moment. It's about bringing your heart and your mind and your soul into this moment and being fully present and declaring God's worth in whatever way is authentic to you. That's worship. Do you worship God passionately? There's a big difference between me saying to Susan, Susan, I love you, and saying, Susan, baby, I love you. With all I am and with all my heart, you're the only woman I ever think about. I love you. You're beautiful, and you're worth everything I'll ever give to you and even more. I'm a blessed man. <laughs> That's how you do it, guys, right there. All right? Now, it's a big difference between those two. When you come to worship, in whatever way that's authentic to you, do you worship God passionately? Because you realize how good God is and how great he is. Renewed people worship God passionately. Let's go on. Uh, beginning in verse 8. 
It says they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. As they listened to the words of the law and as they worshiped God, God's word revealed how they were called to live and who they were called to be. And as they realized how far apart they were from God's plan for them, the people began to weep and to mourn. They saw that they were not at all who God had called them to be, and they had not been doing the things that God had called them to do. And the people began to weep and mourn and wail out loud. So the priest said, hey, guys, stop all that. This is going to be a day of celebration. But when you're experiencing spiritual renewal, sin hurts. When you're experiencing renewal, your sin hurts. Have y'all ever hurt somebody that you really loved? I can remember a, a, a day I was on Lake Conway with somebody I really loved. And, uh, and we were coming across, and they had not let me fish where I wanted to fish, so I was mad. The Bible says all our quarrels start like that. We don't get what we want, and I was mad. And, and so we were riding back across the lake, and I tried to think of the most hurtful thing I could say to this person. And I thought of it, and then I said it. And about 10 minutes later, I felt awful. I mean, it hurt. Uh, because I loved them, and I loved them deeply. And to think that I said that to them hurt, not because I was going to experience some consequence, uh, not because I might get in trouble, but because I simply love them. Renewal is not about rules. It's about relationship. It's about loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And when we begin to love God with all that we are, our sin hurts. Not because we might get caught, not because we might get consequences from it, but simply because we love God. And the thought that we have done something uh, against him, it hurts. And it causes us pain. Does your sin hurt? Does it hurt because you love God? Not because of the consequences, but simply because you've betrayed somebody who's given so much to you. Does your sin hurt? Let's keep on reading. Verse 13. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scribe to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had been returned from exile built booths and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was very great. As the Israelites listened to the word of God, they discovered that they were supposed to observe the, fe the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, a time when they would remember how they lived in the wilderness and God provided for them. And they were supposed to build booths uh, and live in those booths for seven days. Uh, and they realized that that was something that they had not done in many, many years, that they were supposed to do every year. And so they heard this from the Word of God, and guess what they did? They went and got some sticks, and they built booths, and they lived in them for seven days. Now, I'm sure some people thought that was very inconvenient. The, the women were thinking, oh, the cooking's going to be out there. How is that going to work? And all sorts of stuff. But they did it anyway. You know what I'm thinking? That was some sermon. I mean, that was some sermon. Because what typically happens on Sundays is that the preacher tries to read the Word of God and explain it to the congregation. And on lots of Sundays, people walk out the door and they say, you know, good sermon, Jeff. And I'm like, thank you very much. That does make me feel good. And, but, but as I watch people walk out those glass doors, I have some little inkling that some people may walk out those glass doors and do the same thing they did last week. You know, they, they come, they're here for a few moments, but there's this eerie feeling that, that sometimes lives don't change all that much. Their lives changed. They obeyed God's word joyfully. They didn't just listen. They applied it to their life, and they changed. 
I don't gauge, uh, when I ask Emily and Abby, my daughters, to do something for me, I don't gauge their love and respect for me based on how emotional their response is to my request. If I ask Emily to go clean her room, and she goes, oh, Father, yes, I would love to go clean my room. You're the best at anything for you, Father. I love you. Now, I don't gauge her love and respect for me based on how emotional her response is to my request. I don't gauge her love and respect for me based on uh, how big her promises are to what I ask her to do. Yes, then I'll do that, and I'll clean out my closet too, and then I'll mow the yard, and I will fold all my clothes. I'll do it all, Dad, just because you asked me to. That's not how I gauge her love and respect. How do you gauge their love and respect for you? Did you do what I asked you to do? That's hard for kids to understand sometimes. But that's how you gauge their love and respect. Did you do what I asked you to do? If God was to look at your life and all the Sundays that you come to worship and listen to the Word of God and go back out and all that kind of stuff, uh, what would it say about the love and respect that you have for your Father? When week after week the Lord speaks to you, tries to speak to you in some way about your life and who he's called you to be and, and what he's called you to do. And, and you go from here, uh, and just an emotional response is God's looking for something more than that. He's looking for something more than good intentions, more than grand promises. God simply wants you to apply what he teaches you to your life. The scripture says that the people obeyed God's word joyfully. It says, from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, till that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was very great. I mean, they, they didn't just go through the motions anymore. They, were, they knew what God wanted them to do, and they were excited to do it because they loved Him. They loved Him. They realized all that God had done for them. They experienced this great love, the power of God, and they said, God, this is what you want us to do. Man, we're happy to do it, God, because we love you. This is exciting. We know we're walking with you and experiencing your blessings as we do what you've called us to do. Do you obey God's Word joyfully? All right, let's just, let's just put our lives up there and look at it. Do you have a love for, for God's Word? Is God's Word sweet to you? All right. Do you experience unity with the body of Christ? As you look around this room, are you at peace with people here? Do you feel more part of this than ever before? Do you worship God passionately? Are you engaged in this moment? Are you just taking up space? Are you here fully with your heart and mind and, and soul? Does your sin hurt? Does your sin hurt because you love him? Because he's your father? Do you obey God's word joyfully? How are you doing? And the important things in life, you don't leave it to feelings. You have gauges. How are you doing? Listen, if, uh, if you say, you know what? I'm not doing so good. I look at my life, and if I'm honest... Uh, I see some areas where, I, where I'm, I'm running near empty. So the point of this is not, not to be discouraged, not to make you feel guilty, but just to say something has to happen then. You can't keep on going the way you're going. You're going to run out of gas on the side of the road. All right? That's what's going to happen. I need to do something uh, that's going to make a change in my life. And listen, we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about how to experience renewal that lasts a lifetime. That's what we're going to talk about when we finish up looking at Nehemiah. And so some of you simply need to be praying, God, what do you, God, I don't want to keep going the same way I'm going right now. God, I'm ready and open to the change that you want to bring to me. God, and just, just allow me, to, allow me to, to, to obey you in a fresh way. Uh, to be open to whatever you're calling me to do, God, so I can experience that renewal that you want from me. Some of you, listen, some of you, I hope, are looking at your life and going, you know what? Man, I, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, as I look at it, I, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than I used to be. It's okay to say that. It's okay to go, man, God, you're actually working in my life. I'm not who I was, but I've been changed, God. And, and it's okay just to praise God and say, thank you, God. That's to boast in Christ that Christ is changing your life. It's not being prideful to say God has done something in my life and that we need to just celebrate and thank God for that. We don't always have to be, be sad in the church. We can throw a party. Thank you, God. You're at work in my life. And listen, if that's where you are, that's great. Next week, we'll talk about how we can make that last a lifetime, how we can experience continual renewal day after day after day. How are you doing? How are you doing? Let's pray.